Well, I've got a message for Josh. It's hard to be more excited than Pastor Jess. How many of you agree? <laughs> we just want to get in your guy's slipstream. How many of you know what a slipstream is? Good morning, everyone. Good morning to all of you here in the sanctuary. Good morning to you online, certainly to those of our brothers and sisters out there on the patio. <clears throat> you know, I, I know what some of you are thinking. I, I just know it. You're thinking, man, we just got Pastor Henny back. What in the world are you doing up there? <laughs> well, I'm sorry. Actually, I'm not sorry. You're stuck with me. So <laughs> will you pray? Will you pray with me online out on the patio here in the, in the auditorium? Let's just join our hearts together. There is no difference in space in the spirit. So, Lord God, we thank you for the opportunity to be in fellowship this morning. We thank you for the privilege that we have to open up the word and then ask you to open our hearts to the word. So speak to us today. We're listening. Speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, everybody? Amen. Amen. <clears throat> I remember uh, hearing a story years ago about an old preacher who visited a local seminary and was speaking to all the young pastors and all the young preachers. And <clears throat> in a moment, I think of abject wisdom, he said to them, he said, you know, guys, he said, when you have the truth, pound the truth. And when you have the facts, pound the facts. And if you don't have the truth or the facts, pound the pulpit. <laughs> well, you know, of course, that's pretty, pretty wise there because if you don't know what you're talking about, creating a distraction will always help. I'm glad here at The Rock that we have a pastor. Aren't you glad that we have a pastor? I don't think I've ever seen Pastor Henny pound the pulpit, but he certainly pounds us with truth and with facts. And we ought to be thankful for that. We ought to be praying for him every day. We're praying for him today as he's in Dallas. We ask God to bless him and, and Pastor Miranda, of course. And so we come back today. Uh, my assignment, of course, is to continue our series on the facts of spiritual life, talking about facts. And Pastor Henny, of course, says, I'm sure most of you know, if not all of you, that he's been challenging us. Uh, he wants us to think deeply he wants us to think critically about the truths that are being presented to us uh, and being presented to us, of course, as facts relating uh, to our spiritual life. Uh, you know, facts and truth are not necessarily the same thing. How many, how many of you know that? Yeah. Facts and truth are not necessarily the same thing. Whoop, 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 whoop. I got it. Let me illustrate that. That wasn't the illustration. I'm holding in my, I'm so glad I didn't drop it. I would have been so embarrassed, more than I already am. <laughs> I am holding in my hand a light bulb. How many of you agree? How many of you see that? Uh, I don't care if you don't like these type of light bulbs. I'm just saying, how many of you see that I'm holding a light bulb in my hand? That's a fact. That's a fact, is it not? The truth is when the light comes on. Now, I haven't developed that gift yet, so we still, need <laughs> we still need electricity. But you get my point, don't you? I better keep this up here for the second service because, man, I almost dropped that. Well, I'll put it back here. So. You get the point. Uh, they're not necessarily the, uh, uh, the same thing, but they certainly have a connection. And we live in a day where biblical truths and facts uh, are being challenged all the time, and we need to realize as Christians that uh, facts are, uh, the biblical facts and, of course, biblical truth, they are timeless, but they're also timely. And our day, of course, is a day where truths are being rejected and facts are being denied. There's a dumbing down in society, I think we all know that, uh, which is also creeping into the church. There's a dumbing down of the church. Uh, truth suffers to be defended, and facts fail to be supported. And it's demonstrated really every day, and of course we all know this, especially in the, the recent political uh, uh, landscape of our country. We know that, uh, especially in politics, 
we see this demonstrated. Uh, did you know there's a whole, uh, over the last uh, number of years now, there's a whole new industry that has evolved called facts checking. How many of you, how many of you know that? Uh, where as soon as a politician stands up and says something, someone's running off to a website, a certain fact-checking website, to determine whether what that person said is factual or not. Uh, I'll never forget, you know, the great Will Rogers once said, if you inject truth into politics, you no longer have politics. <laughs> By the way, there's a lot of truth to that, <laughs> and that's a fact. So survey polls continue to show that <clears throat> the level of trust in those who have the facts and are supposed to be telling us the truth, of course, that the level of trust is declining. And why is that? Well, the, the reason why is because they don't. <laughs> they don't what? They don't have the facts or they're denying them and they're not telling the truth. And I think all of us know that. And we're increasingly dismayed, are we not, in our day? So many people today just don't seem to care about the facts, and insofar as facts, of course, relate to truth, they don't seem to care about the truth as well, especially what we refer to as absolute truth. You've heard that term, haven't you? This idea of absolute truth. There's, a, there, there's probably some basic definitions of it. Let me give you my definition. Uh, this is my definition of absolute truth. Are you ready? Absolute truth something that is true in any day, at any time, all the time. It's a simple definition. That's a, I, I think that's a good working definition of absolute truth, something that is true in any day, at any time, for all time. And of course, you know, our current culture has embraced an insidious lie that there is no such thing as absolute truth. So you have... Uh, a professor who stands up in his class in front of impressionable young people and he declares or she declares, I want you to know today that there is no such thing as absolute truth and I believe that absolutely. And then you wonder why when your kids come home you have problems. Listen, denying absolute truth is an absurdity, logically. And of course, it's also a transgression theologically. Why? Because it betrays the pride of the human heart. It is this uh, shaking a fist, as it were, at God and saying, we will not have you to reign over us. We will not have your truth dictate to us. And therein lies the key to in my opinion, absolute truth, it is at home in the sovereignty of God. Come on. It is at home in the sovereignty of God. Absolute truth needs no other justification than a sovereign, immutable God. And yet again, you have celebrities and people saying, one celebrity I heard said, she said, I live my life by my truth. It may not be your truth, but it is my truth. Without, of course, realizing that truth cannot be personalized nor branded. We need to understand today, look, here's a fact. You want a fact? There is no, there is no her truth and no my truth. There is no your truth, and there is no their truth. There is just the truth. You see, the problem with truth is that it always gets in the way of ignorance. And that's a fact. Our cultural landscape is littered with libel and lies and untruths and half-truths and the almost true along with fables and fiction instead of facts. A century ago, someone came up with the statement, a lie can travel halfway around the world while truth is still putting on its shoes. Have you ever heard that slogan? 
That was stated 100 years ago before the internet. Now it goes 10 times around the earth. And truth is still trying to figure out someone who might declare it. So I wonder if you agree today. We need truth. <laughs> and we need facts. And the more so in the spiritual world. A spiritual world, listen to me guys, that comes with its own built-in ancient distorter of facts and teller of lies, the one Jesus called the father of lies. And the church is not immune from beliefs that are based on partial truths and distorted facts. We call them heresies, and the church has been battling heresies for 20-plus centuries. It's the reason this series that we're involved in here at the Rock Church is so important. We need doctrinal clarity. Pastor Henny has been saying, he said it just last week from this platform, we need sound theology. That's what he said. We need the facts of spiritual life. Listen to me. Theology is not obsolete and doctrine is not a dirty word. We need facts that are foundational, beliefs that are basic, truths that are indisputable, irreproachable, immutable. Look, they, they are just as important in the spiritual world as universal laws are in the physical world. You know that, right? Think of the universal laws that uh, dictate to us and that we are uh, bound to obey. And if we don't, we risk peril. The law of gravity. Look, if you fall out a window, you're not falling up. It's a universal law, unless you're in the space station. I mean, it's as simple as one plus one equals two, and it's always going to equal two, no matter what modern math says. It's never going to equal three. If you want three, how about the three R's? And no, I'm not talking about writing, reading, and arithmetic. I'm talking about Rusticos, Richies, and Rodrigos. And in that area. And it's in that order. That's a fact. <laughs> We're talking facts. We're not talking opinions and hearsay, rumors, and idle talk. Yeah, the Latin word, the, the, our word facts come from a Latin word that means a deed that is done. I, I like that because it makes it a verb. It makes it verifiable, something that is accomplished, something that is done. Listen to me, guys. To the degree that we can equate biblical facts with absolute truth, we need to understand. Listen. Don't shoot the messenger. I'm just going to tell you, it doesn't matter whether you affirm the truths or believe the truth because the truth is still facts and the facts are still true, whether you believe them or not, whether you affirm them or not. And that's why this series is so important. <clears throat> Pastor Henny and I have discussed this. He talked... He was telling me, you know, I, I want the folks to get that these are building blocks. You can't move on to the next one until you affirm this one in terms of what we're doing. And he knows, because we've discussed it, that the one we're going to share today is the foundational one. You'll see that in a moment, I trust. Pastor Henry said, if you don't get this truth here, there is nothing for you to move on to next. If you don't understand and apply biblical fact, there is nothing next upon which you can build. So, that brings us then to today's truth. <laughs> the light that's going to come from the biblical fact. I want to offer to you, that was just an introduction. <laughs> Pastor Handy's not the only one that can do that. <laughs> I've been preaching longer than him. I don't preach as well as him, but I've been preaching longer than him. 
I want to offer to you what is the most basic statement of all spiritual facts for the Christian. Now, I know that's a, that's a statement for which I will be accountable. So I want to say it again. Are you listening? The most basic statement of all spiritual facts for the Christian. And by the way, I know I have my facts straight because Jesus is the one who said this is the greatest of all statements. He said this is the one laid down for us that we might apply to our spiritual lives. And that's a fact. So what is it? Well, it's Jesus' response to a learned lawyer of Judaism who asked him basically this question. Why don't you tell me what is the greatest fact? (laughs) What is the greatest truth? What is the greatest law that I should know? He was saying, what is the greatest truth that I can apply to my life? Now, are you with me, everybody? Come on, I need to know. Are you with me? He didn't say, tell me one of the greatest. Huh? He said, "Uh, Jesus, you claim to know everything. I need to know 10 of the the best things I can. No, he said, tell me the greatest truth you can give me. If you won't agree with me on that, we might as well stop now. And so Jesus obliged him. This is what he said. It's in the Gospels. We'll quote it from Matthew chapter 22, beginning... In verse 37, Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Can I hear an amen? Amen. There is nothing more foundational than that. I didn't say that. Jesus did. There's nothing more basic than that. That's what Jesus Christ said. Now, (laughs) I can only do kind of a broad outline on this today. Someone should write a book on it. (laughs) That's a hint. The man asked Jesus... For the one basic truth of life, based on the one fact set forth in the word. And did you notice this? Come on, did you notice it? Jesus gave him two. Uh Uh-oh. But the reason he did that is because the two are the same. Now we've got to start there too. We've got to affirm that. That's a fact. And each one fulfills the other. You need to see that. And they are both based on and grounded in the same thing. Because listen to me now, you ready? The greatest fact of our spiritual life is based on one word. The greatest fact of our spiritual life is based on one concept. L-O-V-E, love. That's what Jesus said. You love Jesus? That's what he just said. Jesus says the greatest fact of your spiritual life, listen to me, is that you love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. That means you love him completely with everything you've got. That means you love him with your emotion, your intellect, and your will. That means you love God first, foremost, finally, and forever. That means you love God on the mountaintop and you love God in the valley. That means you love God in the sunshine and in the rain. You love him in the calm and in the storm. That means you love God when you feel like it and when you don't feel like it. Eric Fromm once said, love is not a victim of my emotions. It's a servant of my will. That's biblical love. Everything else is human love. It's capricious. It's fickle. He loves me. He loves me not. He loves me. He loves me not. That's not God's love. 
Jesus said, this is the greatest thing you can do. Come on, guys. This is, there's nothing greater you can do. Nothing. I dare you to find something in the Word that's greater than what Jesus just said that you can do. That's a fact. Are you getting the light? <laughs> that's a fact. But wait. <laughs> wait a minute. That's not all. He also said the great commandment is in two parts. And they are equal. They are equal. He said the second is like the first. He didn't say the second follows the first. He didn't say do the first, then you do the second. He said the second is like the first. It's the same thing as the first. He said, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Notice, and love, not then love. Come on, get that? The scripture says, love God and love your neighbor. It doesn't say, love God, then love your neighbor. Because the Word of God knows, Jesus knows, when you love your neighbor, you're loving God. Wow. Oh, man. That's light. And if I'm loving God, I'm loving my neighbor. Whoa. You say, come on, really? we got to love those stinky, dirty people. We're like Linus, when Lucy tells him, you've got to love the world. And Linus says to Lucy, I love the world. It's people I can't stand. <laughs> Are you like that? Well, who is our neighbor? Because that's really where it comes down to. I guarantee you there's not one of you in this auditorium today that wouldn't say, that would say, I don't love God. No, you're going to say, I love God. But how many of you are going to say unreservedly, truthfully, it's a fact, I love my neighbor? So who is our neighbor? You know, we think neighbor is someone who just lives in close proximity to us. The other side of the fence or across the street, there are those who or with whom we have a good relationship and, of course, with some we don't. That's why Benjamin Franklin once said, Love your neighbors, but don't pull down your fence. <laughs> I, I like G.K. Chesterton, who quipped once that the Bible commands us to love our neighbors and also our enemies because probably, generally, they're the same people. <laughs> well, my definition is simply this. I put it in my book. A neighbor is someone who is nearby wherever you are. Whoa. That means it's mobile. Come on. That means God may bring a neighbor into your path situationally. A shameless plug for my book is that we've got to get away from this corporate paradigm of priority keeping God first, family second church third, work fourth or flop them, whichever way you want to God at the center yeah. don't isolate him in first place center of your life and he can touch anybody at any time everywhere depending on the situation yeah. we don't live our lives sequentially we live our lives situationally dynamic when you get a hold of that one if you don't think loving your neighbor is a spiritual fact consider this folks in scripture no less than eight times we are called upon to do just that the first time it appears and what Jesus was quoting of course is Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 18 you shall love your neighbor as yourself I am the Lord and there is Yahweh I am the Lord then it's quoted 
Four times in the Gospels, Matthew 19, 19, Matthew 22, 39, where we just read it, Mark 12, 31, and Luke chapter 10, verse 27. Paul quotes it in, in, in Romans chapter 13, verse 9. He says this, Romans 13, 9, all the commandments are summed up in this saying, saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. He does it again with the Galatians, chapter 5, verse 14, for all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. By the way, do you see something missing there? Come on, do you see something missing there? What you ought to say is, yeah, Pastor Joe, I notice he doesn't say love God. Why is that? At no time does Paul say love God, and that fulfills the commandment. He says love your neighbor, and that fulfills the commandment. Why? Because Paul knew when you love your neighbor, you're loving God. You can't do one without the other. James comes in, James chapter 2, verse 8. He says, and this is from the New Century Version, this royal law is found in the Scriptures. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. If you obey this law, you are doing right. Wow. None of these Scriptures mention loving God. Why? Because it's understood. Come on. It's understood. They knew, Paul and James, they knew to do one is to prove the other. And that explains, this is the only way you can understand a verse like 1 John chapter 4, verses 20 and 21. Uh, let me share it with you in Pastor Henny's favorite paraphrase, the message. If anyone, John says, if anyone boasts, I love God, and goes right on hating his brother or sister, thinking nothing of it, he is a liar. If he won't love the person he can see, how can he love the God he can't see? The command we have from Christ is blunt. That means it's a fact. <laughs> loving God includes, finish it with me, loving people. You've got to do both. Do I have to interpret that for you? Come on. You get out there on the highways and the byways. You get out there in the Agora and the marketplace and you claim you love God, but you don't love people. You are lying. You're lying to yourself. And that's what makes the great commandment the greatest of all truth statements for Christians. And that's a fact. <laughs> love God. And love your neighbor as yourself. It is the supreme priority of discipleship. Let me tell you, there's no greater priority in discipleship. You want to be a disciple of Christ? You don't start here, you're not going anywhere else. I'm sorry. You may think you are, but you're not. A priority that is situational, as I said, not sequential. It demands God at the center of your life. I certainly would suggest that will make it more effective. It is two deeds done as one, and there is nothing in Scripture that you can do that is greater than what Jesus just told you. And I would simply like to say, without belaboring the point, that's a fact. Pastor Henny would say, if you don't get your facts straight here, if you don't embrace this truth today, now, there's not much else to build upon. If you don't apply Matthew chapter 22, there is no other scriptures that will matter. Yeah, yeah. So Memorize the whole book of Romans, I don't care. Yeah. I mean, come on. <laughs> what are you going to offer to God as an alternative? That's a good way to come at it, right? What do you think? What are you going to offer God as an alternative to loving him always and only and loving your neighbor intentionally and earnestly? Name one if you can. There's nothing you can substitute for living the truth of the great commandment. That's why, listen, that's why 1 Corinthians, one of our favorite texts in the Bible, is it not? 
1 Corinthians chapter 13, just the first few verses. That's why it's so important. If Paul says, I could speak all the languages of earth and angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but didn't love others, I would be nothing if I gave everything I have to the poor. And even sacrifice my body, I could boast about it, but if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. What are you going to do with that text? Yeah. Do all these things that you do as Christians, and come on, as Christians, we have all kinds of things we do. Come on. We're busy about all kinds of things as Christians. Do all these things as Christians, but fail at the most basic thing a Christian can do, and all of those things mean very little in God's economy, I'm here to tell you. None of those things, important as they are, I'm not belittling them, I'm just saying they're not as important. None of those things, important as they may be, are what Christians are supposed to be known for, and guess who we have as an authority on what Christians are supposed to be known for? Guess who? Yeah, you were supposed to say Jesus. <laughs> Here it is, John chapter 13, verse 35. How many of you know this verse? Come on, let me see your hands. It's, a, it's one of my favorite verses. Everybody knows this. Not too many understand it or live it. Jesus said, by this all will know, all men will know that you are my disciples. How, Jesus? How are people going to know that we are a disciple of yours? Well, because you can quote the book of Romans. <laughs> if you, come on, finish it with me, have love for one another. Not only is this the most important fact of your spiritual life, now this is important to get, it's also the most difficult. We can acknowledge that. We have to be honest. God knows that. Be, come on, being busy about all our Christian stuff is easy. Come on, preaching is easy, praying is easy, giving is easy, studying is easy, loving someone else, that's not easy. That is a fact. To live above with saints we love, oh, that will be glory but to dwell below with people we know. Now that's another story. <laughs> no, it's, living. it's loving that's difficult. And especially the type of love that Jesus is talking about in the great commandment. You know, of course, you've heard this enough, it's agape, the Greek word agape. There are four different Greek words for love, three of which are in the New Testament. Phileo, brotherly love, Storge, a kind of fa uh, family uh, empath empathetic kind of love. Eros, we get our word erotic from it, purely biological sexual love. And agape is the unfailing, unconditional love. And it's that type of love that is in Matthew 22. It is that type of love that Jesus said, you will be known to be my disciple if you're known for that. Because agape love, listen to me very quickly, is a love that is sacrificial, it is a love that is serving, and it is a love that is steadfast. Will you remember that? It is sacrificial. If your love doesn't sacrifice, it's not agape. It is a love that serves. If your love is not motivating you and, and, and propelling you into serving, it's not agape. And, your love, and agape love is steadfast. If your love cannot endure... If it's capricious and fickle, you only love when someone loves you back... That's Phariseeism, that's not agape. And it will cost you to love like that. It will cost you to love God and others. <laughs> but it may cost you more not to. Hmm. Wow. How many of you ever read what C.S. Lewis wrote about the price to be paid when you love the way Jesus tells you to love? Can I quote it for you? 
The great C.S. Lewis wrote, to love at all is to be vulnerable. How many of you know that? Come on, how many of you know that? He says, love anything and your heart will be wrong and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping your heart intact, you must not give it to anyone, not even to an animal. (laughs) Wrap it carefully round with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket of your selfishness. But in that casket, Lewis says, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. He concludes the only place outside of heaven where you can be perfectly safe from all the dangers of love is hell. So I suspect that while Jesus confronting Peter in the 21st chapter of John about his level of love has an immediate context. I think Jesus is also speaking to Pastor Joe and Pastor Jess, especially to Josh. (laughs) And to all of us. Peter, do you love me? Agape. And Peter says, yes, Lord, I hit Facebook like, I like you. Phileo. No, I'm serious, phileo. Feed my sheep. Peter, second time, Peter, do you love me, agape? Peter says, Lord, you know I like you, phileo. Feed my sheep. A third time, Peter, do you agape me? Peter, a third time, Lord, you know, I phileo you. Peter never got it. Peter never said agape, not once. Interesting, isn't it? Three times Jesus asked Peter if he was willing to love with the type of love that would be the hallmark of Christianity, and three times Peter did not get it. He never even got to the level of agape. But listen, before you want to criticize Peter, you're just as hard-hearted and thick-headed as he is. It's a good thing for Peter. He finally did get it. How do I know that? Because I read 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. <laughs> At 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8, Peter says this to us. This is Peter. And above all things, have fervent... Guess what word that is? Have fervent agape for one another. For agape will cover a multitude of sins. Peter wrote that. He finally got it. By the way, it's interesting because that equation, everybody wants a debate. Why did Jesus ask Peter three times all this kind of stuff? Don't miss the point. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll serve. You'll feed my sheep. If you love me, you'll love others. Mm. Did the light just go off? Great commandment. Truth. Well, let's try and wrap this up. How many of you know what the missional statement of the Rock Church is? Do you know what it is? The Rock Church is committed to loving God, serving others, growing in Christ, and reaching our world. Not hard to memorize, I just did it. (laughs) No. That's the mission. That's who we are. Come on. That's who we are. That's a fact. That's the truth of the fellowship of the Rock Church. And what's dynamic about it, praise the Lord, it's based on the great commandment. That's where we start, loving God and loving others. When you think of the great commandment in Matthew chapter 22, how important is this fact that I've shared with you today? Can I tell you with no fear of being successfully contradicted. It's everything. How important is this truth? It's everything. Let me tell you something. 
Only in tennis does love mean nothing. <laughs> Everywhere else, and especially in Christianity, it means everything. Amen? It just absolutely does. And that's an absolute truth. It means everything. In everything else, love means everything. It's the only thing. It's the only thing that identifies you as a Christ follower. Everything else can be, let me tell you, I, I just got to tell you this before we leave. Everything else can be counterfeited. How many of you know that the devil can counterfeit or duplicate any Christian experience, including spiritual gifts, the devil can counterfeit anything except agape love. He can't do that because God is love. <laughs> huh? First John, God is agape. The devil can't even touch that, can't even get close to it. Everything else he can fake you out with. Everything else. But not that. The fact of spiritual life today is the truth of love, to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself. It is an irresistible fact, and it is an irreplaceable truth. It cannot be faked. It cannot be avoided. It can't be made simple. It is the most demanding calling associated with your discipleship. There's no greater calling on your life than that. And I'm telling you the greatest truth based upon the greatest fact of spiritual living. Love God with everything you've got for as long as you've got. And love your neighbor with everything you are wherever you are, whenever you get there. Amen? Will you pray with me? That's the truth. And that's a fact. Now we're before the Lord. We're before His Spirit. I'm praying the Spirit is bringing conviction to our hearts and not just for those in this place and online who may not know the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm talking about us as Christians. The Spirit is bringing a challenge to your own heart today as well. But especially for you today who might not know the Lord. If you've never confessed Jesus Christ, let me tell you something today here in this auditorium, out on the patio, certainly online. Let me tell you something today. He wants to save you with that same agape love that we're talking about, that love that is sacrificial, for God so loved the world, he gave his son for you. That love that is serving, the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life for you. That love is steadfast. Jesus said in John 13, 1, it said of Jesus, he loved you to the end, forever. Why would you reject a love like that? Huh. Don't reject God's love today. So our heads are bowed. I'm not asking for a show of hands or anything like that. God knows. That's much more important. He knows your heart. But right now, we're going to pray together. We're going to pray together. Online, outside, here in the, in the building. And you, a, a simple prayer. To receive that love that knows no bounds. He loves you as if there was only one of you to love. If you were the only person on earth he would still love you the way he loves all of us today. Just you. 
So let's pray. Will you pray with me? God in heaven, I am lost. I am without love. I'm asking now for the love of Jesus Christ to flood my life, to flood my heart, that Jesus would save me now and forever. I claim him as my Lord and my Savior. Thank you, God, for your love your steadfast, sacrificial, serving love. And I am saved today because of that love. In the name of Jesus, I pray, amen. What do you think about that?